nuclear mission, if you will. I work for PAE Systems, and I'm working on the Sentinel ICBM program, which is the new placement program for the main fan missile. Awesome, thank you for having me. My name is Bill Shepard. I also work for Virginia work for the museum as a docent. Well, I think you're closer to this how's this? In the ham radio business we call this swallowing the mic. Uh, I am older than dirt compared to most folks here. But I've also had a great time. Um, background: Grew up in San Diego, California, around the county. Uh, quite a bit of that on a, on a ranch uh, up in the hills near the border. Uh, at that time, Southern California was paradise, and uh, very, very active in aviation activities. A lot of manufacturers in San Diego. Large being a copier. So I can remember laying in an alfalfa field and watching B-36s glide their way to the east out of the bird field. And I always thought that was fascinating, but I never wanted to fly anything that big. But also at that time, the home of Navy fighter aviation. And that's what I wanted to do. I had a good job in high school, so I learned to fly a private pilot's license. I graduated from the Air Force ROTC program down the road here at Brigham Young University. I was commissioned to the Air Force as a second lieutenant. And if I have to uh, describe my career, it would be that I could never hold a job very long. I, I was privileged to be in a transitional period for the Air Force where a lot of weapon systems were beginning to age out. There were a lot of new ones coming in, a lot of things going on. So I was fortunate in being able to participate in uh, a number of weapon systems. The first one out of pilot training at uh, Enid, Oklahoma, in advance. The Lake Tornado is a wonderful place. <laughs> was the F-100 Super Saber, our first uh, supersonic fighter, or level flight anyway sits in the position of honor leading our, our collection of uh, Century Series fighters. The F-100 uh, took me to Southeast Asia, to Tuiwa, uh, and Fan Rang in the Republic of Vietnam. Uh, many wonderful experiences there. Uh, I learned to love close air support. Uh, when the GI's in trouble and you do your job right, he's no longer in trouble. It's quiet. Feel like a fireman and just pull the cat out of the house. From there, I had all, all of my compadres went back to Myrtle Beach to uh, be A7 drivers, and somehow I wound up in Lubbock, Texas, in the P 38, uh, just constructing Iranians in the dust. Uh, after a couple of years of that, uh, I was looking for any assignment I could find, and uh, somebody was desperate enough for a language qualified people that I got to go to Panama to fly the uh, A-37 and in route they gave them away to the North Vietnamese and uh, intermediate. Uh, and I wanted to fly the O-2 for three years to Panama. Those of you who haven't figured out what those are, you've got one back here that uh, push me pull you, one of its uh, more critical names. It's uh, slow and it's uh, heavy, the way we put the quarter ton of radio in it. But we could operate it out of banana plantations to stretch us on highway and talk on three radios and two languages simultaneously. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the most fun jobs I had, even though the airplane was not my favorite. Uh, from there, I came uh, up to Luke for a short course in uh, the F 4. I came here and uh, flew with the 421st Black Widows for a couple of years. See, OC not is that uh, OC. Was, I were contemporaries here. Uh, and of course, most of my contemporaries at that time had all been to Southeast Asia, so it was like nobody having a remote tour. So I got to go to Osaka, Korea, again in the F4, for another remote tour. Uh, from there, I wanted to 
brought my horizons a bit. Took a consecutive overseas tour to Hahn Air Base, Germany, now known as uh, Frankfurt Hahn Airport. Nice hub for Ryanair. In uh, those days, it was uh, three squadrons of F fours. We were either deployed to Insulik or Valdegolta uh, or Aviano or sitting alert on a B-61 to take our look at our collection of uh, nuclear shapes in the front gallery and go see what a B-61 was. Uh, if the other squadrons were deployed, then you picked up their lights and so sometimes you'd be gone for six weeks, come home, have one night at home, and go on 10 days of nuclear third. Uh, I, I honestly wasn't broken hearted when they stood my squadron down I'm looking for a job. As I mentioned, I love close air support. Uh, I went over to RAF Mountwaters in England and talked to the uh, A-10 guys and found out I love their attitude, I love their mission, and I volunteered to go there. I flew with the 509 squadron at RAF Mountwaters for two years, and then uh, got put at the time. It was a dream job of running a, the operation at uh, one of the full-time forward operating locations in uh, the line was in Bavaria at to the 81st Fighter Wing. And uh, on a German air base, they treated us like kings. And uh, they, they worked like bankers. They were, the base closed at 6 p.m. every night. Once a quarter, they'd stay open, let us get our night flying requirements. <laughs> <laughs> the sun would set, we'd shoot a couple of and go home by 7 or It was a racket. Uh, <laughs> At the end of that assignment, my luck ran out. They said, 18 years to go, it's funny. You know, you can't get promoted again without a staff job. They didn't care that I didn't care. So I found a job that looked interesting up at the J3, uh, the operations director at the headquarters of European Command in Stuttgart, Patch Burris. Went up there and a very interesting job, no flying, but uh, very interesting projects. Uh, at the end of two years there, as I, as I mentioned to Carlos, the, the Air Force decided to put the 06 board off for a year. And none of the options coming up looked good. So I ran into a friend at Plants and he said, hey, Chef, the airlines are higher than old folkies. This was the first year in 1988 that the major airlines started hiring people over the age of 40. I was at least one of the Five oldest guys hired in the Delta Airlines in 1988. And, uh, had a second career with Delta Airlines. Very slowing, loved it. Retired in 2004, age 60 retirement was mandatory at that time. Uh, two years later, Delta went through Chapter 11 bankruptcy and canceled the uh, pilot retirement plan. And so I flew uh, citation business jets for several years after that. So, as I say, I couldn't hold a job for any time, but I had a heck of a good time. So, that's me. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, all three. So, we're going to give you an audience a chance. I am the uh, I'm a teacher by trade, so I'm going to give you all about 30 seconds to a minute to start thinking about questions you'd love to ask these gentlemen. Or if the clock starts now. Looks like we got one. Okay. What was the worst emergency situation you had in the air? Good question. For those of you in the audience that might not have been able to hear, what was the most, what was the emergency situation, urgent situation you had worse in the air, and what was it? We're going to start over there with Bill. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Uh, because it was a C-130, 
<laughs> um, just to put some perspective on that, the oldest C-130 that I got to work uh, came off the assembly line when Kennedy was still president. So they had issues, right? Um, so the J model coming out was great. I never got a J right. So. Uh, but the worst thing that happened to me on a crew I was participating on, we were on an active mission in a sensitive area, as we say, and we had a fuselage fire uh, inside the aircraft. That was a good one. Um, so we had a, it turned out to be an electrical box inside, we had cables everywhere. Um, and just as a reminder, I was an Intel guy. So the back of our C-130 did not have uh, any space for cargo. It was all intelligence collection related electronics. And one of those boxes overheated and actually caught fire. And then the insulation starts going and the cables start burning and all the other stuff. And um, it was a little hairy there for a while because we were not in a very friendly area to put down. And so, and we're out there alone, unarmed and unafraid. So, um, no fighters were going to come help us, uh, no U.S. bases anywhere near the place. So we were in a real pickle. And so fighting that fire became a little more hairy than probably usual. We got it under control and we continued on with the mission and we just turned off that equipment and just kept on trucking. But um, that was a little scary when, you, when you're in a crew serve aircraft, uh, like a large head, a fatty, um, we generally don't wear all of our gear. It's not like a fighter guy has to wear all of his stuff because he may have to get out just like that, right? If we're lucky enough to get out, generally we have a few minutes sometimes, a minute, a minute, two minutes. Put all your stuff on and get ready to go. And when that happens and you start putting on all your gear, it starts to get real. Holy cow, I may have to jump out of this. <laughs> and there, it was at night, it was a night mission. Um, a 20 person member crew, we had 20 members on the crew. So when you go out with that many people, you're probably not gonna find each other on the ground. You're gonna be truly alone. Um, and that, yeah, that gets real. So that was probably my most stressful emergency, actual emergency in the air. So I'm glad uh, Bill went first because it gave me time to think about this for a little bit. But uh, so the aircraft that I was on was the Navy E60 aircraft, which was the 707s variant. And uh, the mission that it did, one of the missions that it did was uh, what we call attack or take charge of the battle, which uh, it carried a very low frequency uh, radio transmitter. But, uh, and the purpose of that very low frequency radio transmitter was to be able to get the nuclear messages to the submarines out in the ocean that were submerged, some, some of the submerged very deep. So in order to be able to do that, the antenna that we used was a copper wire antenna that was three miles long. And they would, uh, they would actually unspool the copper wire out the back of the aircraft uh, all the way to three miles. And then we would put the aircraft, um, oh, it was at uh, just above Salsi with uh, about a 30 degree bank and uh, with the nose up altitude, doing about one and a half G's for about an hour. Uh, and the purpose of that was to coil the wire. And once you have the wire coiled just right, then you can transmit the message and it would actually go through the surface of the earth and, and get down to the submarine. So, because we had such a long wire this time, they didn't want us to extend that wire to the United States. Because if we extended it, we couldn't pull it back in. That meant we had to cut it and drop it. The last thing uh, Uncle Sam wanted to do was pay for a dead cow on Farmer Brown's field. So, uh, so what we would do is we'd fly down to the Gulf of Mexico. And once we were out over the water, that's when we would extend it, and that's when we'd start our work. Well, on this one particular flight, we're in the middle of the orbit. We're about 20 minutes into it. And uh, the crew would come through the back. Now, I was part of the U.S. Track Home Battle Staff, so eight of us on the aircraft were Battle Staff members uh, from all different services, from 
Air Force, uh, Army, Marines, uh, Navy, but the rest of the Air Crew uh, for the, uh, was, was all Navy, including the communications crew. Well, so the Navy crew in the back, the comm crew reports smoke in the cabin. So now we have to pull out of orbit, level it out, and the Navy starts their procedures for uh, finding where the smoke is coming from. My job on the battle staff as an air crew member, put my mask on and stay out of the way. Uh, and for us, our, our oxygen masks were full face, like firefighter masks. So get in my seat, make sure my seatbelt's on, got my mask on, <laughs> stay out of the way as the Navy crew running back up and down the aisle trying to figure out where the smoke is coming from. Well, as part of their procedures for trying to figure out the, where the smoke is coming from, they're going to isolate different uh, parts of the electrical system. And imagine when they got to the bus to where they turn off the lights. And this is an aircraft that had no windows. So it goes pitch black. We have thick smoke in the, ca uh, in the cabin. And you're wearing an oxygen mask. And you're out of the Gulf of Mexico. And I'm not a pilot, so it's like being the person in the backseat of the car when something starts to go wrong. Uh, so it gets a little hairy there. So eventually they found what it was and ended up being one of the amplifiers for the BLF uh, radio that, uh, that uh, went uh, all along. Uh, but they isolated it. Eventually the smoke dissipated. But now we have a part two of the problem. They can't get the wire to come back in. So now the Navy has to go through their procedures to see if they can't break it loose, get it to come back and spool back into the aircraft. And that meant violent actions with the aircraft. The pilot would uh, basically take a stick and push it forward and back side to side on every direction. It's like the worst roller coaster ride for uh, to get it to come back in. And uh, unfortunately, in this case, uh, nothing worked. So the final thing was cut the wire and let three miles worth of the wire fall into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and then we still had close to a four hour flight back to Hoffman after all this is said and done. So it made for a very long flight, but uh, yeah, I would count that as probably my worst experience uh, for emergency. I'm just thinking about the uh, what that three miles of copper wire would be worth right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I mentioned, I flew a lot of thin jerk lights. Some of them were kind of war weary. So we we had a lot of experiences with emergency procedures. And so I have a lot to choose from. But in hindsight, I think the closest I came to killing myself because I was a stupid young lieutenant was on a mission out of Puyama off the alert pad when they would launch us off the alert pad and then somebody was in trouble. And so you didn't give up easily. As I mentioned, some of the birds were, all of the birds were pretty war weary at that time. These were F 100s, single seat, single engine, uh, one airplane if it didn't kill you. We launched off the alert pad, took off to the west, right into a thunderstorm. As soon as we got airborne, picked up the gear, picked up the flaps, tried to rejoin, as I mentioned, I was a very young lieutenant at the time, trying to re rejoin on Lee before he went into the clay, and realized that my cockpit was getting kind of warm. Well, there's the procedure for that, and it turned down. <laughs> It didn't work. The procedure for that then is to override it. That didn't work. After that, you hit the cutoff. It cuts off all the pressurization and air conditioning of the cockpit. That didn't work either. By this time, I'm rejoined on the uh, on lead, but the airfield is closed behind us for the, because of the thunderstorm that we were trying to stay out of. You don't want to admit you got a problem because you know somebody needs that ordinance, but it was getting very uncomfortable. So I said, Lena, I got a board, I got a hot cockpit, 
I can't get it, get over right, and uh, I need to get this back on the ground. Uh, he was a good guy, but he said, okay, we'll go to Fan Rank because he knew he could get an F-100 fixed at Fan Rank with that F-100 unit. Also, because he had a lot of buddies at the unit down there, he wanted to go visit. <laughs> that meant we overflew a very long and useful runway to Cameron to get there. It continued to get hot in the cockpit. That kind of heat can be subtly dangerous. And I'm gripped by heat, and, I, and it, again, in hindsight, I said it should have said something and seen to the flight lead and landed at Cameron. We come on down to uh, Fan Rain. Come up initial and I'm, I'm in bad shape. The last step in the emergency, if you can't do it any other way, is to open the window. Genesis, you know, the canopy. But you don't want to do that. They're expensive, they're hard to replace. I can do this, I can do this. We pitched out, we landed. Get taxied into the DR area. They de-armed our guns, pinned our bombs, made it all safe. Of course, as soon as I actually got slowed on the runway, opened the canopy. As soon as I got to a speed where I didn't think it would be blown off, that felt good. Yeah. Pulled in the DR area, supposed to put your hands on the canopy so they know you're safe. Find it, and immediately went to the pocket of my G suit and pulled out the flask of water. That we always kept in the freezer, we would take them out, and usually by the time you come off, came off the target and started heading home, it would be nice and cold and melted. Well, I pulled that out, took a big swig of some of the hottest water I've ever put in my mouth that didn't have hot chocolate in it, <laughs> and realized that, that was that was close. Part of the airplane, I couldn't get out of the airplane. I had to get me out from the airplane. Uh, severely dehydrated. Uh, in hindsight, I should have blown the canopy and uh, dealt with that and the other things later. I learned a great lesson from that. So, I, as I say, in hindsight, it was not the time I was the most scared, but I think it's the closest I ever came to killing myself in an airplane. The fans, by the nature, are not too bright. Well, okay. So let's ask another audience question. Mr. Colonel Rice, uh, how long were how long were your uh, looking get class missions and also uh, your comical missions? Okay, yeah. So, how long was the looking glass missions? And Tactical missions. Uh, the minimum was six hours. Uh, at the time that uh, I was flying on the jet between 2000 and 2003, uh, we stopped flying the round the clock looking glass mission in the air in 1998. So at, prior to 1998, so from the late 1960s to 1998, that mission, the looking glass mission, was in the air 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And when one aircraft was at the end of its mission, the second one would go up and replace it in the air, and the first one would come back down to land. They stopped doing that in 98. They changed it to a ground alert, to where it was at off the Air Force Base, and the aircraft was configured for a quick takeoff, and the crew was on alert, and stayed in the alert facility on the flight line right next to, to the jet. And we had to be able to respond to the jet and be in the air within minutes. So when we did go airborne, we were there for a minimum of six hours. My longest flight was 14 hours. Um, and it just so happens that that longest flight was on 9 11, 2001. So I was in the air and I had taken off the night before at about 10 o'clock at night, night before, 10 of September. And we were in the middle of an exercise. Uh, U.S. track on exercise, and that morning we were within an hour of the end of our mission. Because we were in an exercise, we were practicing the 24 hours in the air. 
So we actually had, we had actually relieved another aircraft the night before, and then we had an aircraft that was going to relieve us that morning. And within an hour before the end of my mission is when everything happened with 9-11. And uh, I was actually on the line with the National Military Command Center hearing it all happen from the conference perspective with the Secretary of Defense on the line and the military commanders on the line. And initially, we're like, is this part of the exercise? It was, it really was confusing to us because we were in the middle of a nuclear exercise and to us, this was just another instance. But of course, then we came to realize the realization this is not an exercise, this is really happening. And the, uh, that's when they ordered all aircraft in the United States might have closest to airports. Nothing was allowed to be in the air except military aircraft. In our mission, looking glass mission, we were actually told to stay in the air. And uh, so we did, uh, but that presented a new problem, which was uh, we were low on fuel. We were on hour number 13, and uh, we didn't have a lot of fuel left in that jet. And so we called for our tanker. And uh, there was a lot of issues of should the tanker be allowed to take off if it's on the ground. And uh, the compromise that ended up happening was uh, you don't get your tanker, but your relief aircraft gets to come up early. And uh, so we started heading back off it. We made a, a uh, satellite connection with our relief aircraft. We transferred all our data to them and said, you have to stick. And within five minutes of saying you have to stick, our tires were hitting the front way that often. We were out of fuel at that point. And that was, uh, uh, but in that mission, uh, if we need to, even today, we're capable of keeping one of those aircraft in the air 24 hours a day for a definite amount of time. Um, what was, for Hill and Dill, what was your longest flight then? And where were you going? Just extend that out a little. Uh, our aircraft was not in flight refuel capable, and it was extremely heavy with all our stuff in it. So, uh, longest flight I logged, well, okay. Uh, there's flights and missions, right? So, sometimes we fly two a days under the same mission number. So, the longest daily total I ever put up was about 16 and a half hours, but that was split in half because we had to land for fuel and then go back up. So, I mean, it's kind of a quibbling thing, but yeah, so about eight hours or so was my longest one, um, but sometimes we fly two a day. The longest flight I ever flew uh, for the Air Force was in the F-4, at the Hill Air Force Base, uh, where we deployed to a German naval air station on the North Sea called Norholz, and coming back against the wind, as I recall, it was about 13 hours and 15 minutes, something like that. Oh, see, does that make sense? Yeah, in a rubber suit, an emergency, with a, uh, an F-4 that had an inoperable autopilot, most of them did, and a backseater who would come straight out of nav school and couldn't keep the airplane. So it was a long way. 11 refueling, because you had to always have enough fuel on board that if for some reason you couldn't hit your anchor point, you could divert without running out of gas in the, over the ocean. Uh, that's the longest one. And it was, uh, I was rubber legged coming down the ladder of that one. I, you know, I didn't have the weed problem that I do now, so I didn't really think about it. I, I did drink a bowl of my water, and yes, I used my fiddle bags, <laughs> which is fun without an autopilot. I'm going to ask a, a slightly change of topic, a follow up question, and also if anyone over here wants uh, to ask a question, I welcome back as well. Um, my name is Elizabeth, and I have the privilege of being able to work with some of these men a couple times a week them and their stories. And I've asked you guys this question, one or two of you this question before, but I think I'm excited to hear the answer again. Um, and I also think this is a, 
I'll probably hear some different answers from some, from some of you. But my question for you is, what is your favorite tradition that you experienced in the military? And not necessarily like in an official sense. We've all, we all know that you've experienced some things off of hours or, or some traditions, and I want to know what your guys' favorite one is. Well, the one that comes to mind that I can talk about, <laughs> even as a non-drinker, I was a participant in a number of dining ins, dining outs, promotion parties, just going to the club after night's wine, after work on a Friday, etc. And one of the traditions, for some reason, is uh, refers to an inanimate insect. And the, when that dead bug call is made, the last one, not on the floor, waving his arms and legs up in the air, is to buy the bar. And some of the dives off the back of bar stools and uh, underneath the pool tables, uh, or crud tables as we call them, which is another tradition. It was fun. Sometimes there was property damage, sometimes there was a certain amount of uh, soft or hard tissue damage, uh, but it was a great tradition, and I do miss that. So, uh, what I'm thinking about as far as traditions is uh, involved in it's probably the same way I'm in the flying community. Uh, what would be first flights, or in my case, for, for missiles, first alerts. Uh, you know, messing, messing with the not so bright second tenants. Uh, the first time they're going out on the road. Uh, we had one instance, uh, I remember, to where one of the the practical jokes, if you will, that we would pull on a brand new second tenant who was going to the missile field for the very first time, and uh, we wait until his crew partner was in the bunk asleep. And there was in the missile field, there was five launch control centers uh, that operated in one squad, and they were connected by you know uh, telephone communications and stuff. So they talked back and forth to each other, but. Uh, uh, you would wait until this new tenant's uh, crew partner was asleep, taking a nap, and he'd call up on the telephone, and it would go something like, uh, yeah, this is uh, Sergeant Snuffy from Wing uh, Bottom of Iron Mountain Control. Um, we need you to bring back an air sample from the Launch Control Center tomorrow morning when you come back from alert. And of course, it'd be a long pause on the phone because this young tenant didn't know what that meant. And when he finally admitted that, well, what is it that I'm supposed to do? Oh, you haven't done this before? Oh, no problem, Lieutenant. I can tell you what to do. You have the garbage bag there at the launch control center. Okay, you do. I need you to take the garbage bag. I need you to open it up and open it up really big and kind of collect the air in the launch control center. And then I need you to tie it off and a really good. I need you to put your name on the outside, the site that you're at, and the date that you took it. And tomorrow we go back and we should pick back the squad and leave it on the desk there. And one of us will come by and pick it up. <laughs> so you always knew that one of these lieutenants got uh, hit when you went into the squad on any given day and there was a bag of air sitting on the counter there with the individual's name on it. <laughs> so, uh, so that was one of the common things, and that was one of the uh, just you said, one of the unwritten uh, <laughs> messages with you guy. And I will tell you, when I was doing the local last station, they messed with me too on my first flight. Not on the flight itself, but while I was flying for six hours at the alert facility, they went into my room and they took my entire room and moved it out to the front wall. <laughs> Perfectly set up just like it was. And my spare flight suit was up flying. <laughs> so, and not a single person would help me move that furniture back inside the office. Uh, so, those, those were the fun times, even when it, uh, when it happened. So. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Um, going back to my Marine Corps days, Marines are big on tradition. I saw a Marine hat out there earlier. So. Never buy, bro? 
Um, but uh, the Marine Corps birthday, 10 November, 1775. It's a big deal in the Marines. We celebrate it pretty hard. Um, most of the time, the command will look the other way in certain minor infractions. But um, the tradition is just before your guest of honor leaves, age dependent, which you'll find out why. Uh, you will grab that individual and you will subject him to what we call carrier qualification, Marine Corps being a naval service. Um, so here's how it works. You get two of these big long tables, you put them down, no tablecloth, just bare wood um, or linoleum because it's the Marines, we're not big on spending money and so because we never had any. Um, and you wet it down with whatever liquids you have laying around. And you get two Marines or two sailors, because we party with sailors too. They'll get down at the end of the table and they'll hold the broomstick about a foot off the table. And you pick up your guest of honor, unknowingly, they usually don't know this is coming. And you pick them up and you put them belly down and you throw them down the table as hard as you can. And you say, you gotta pick up your legs, pick up your feet, right? To catch the broom before you go off the end of the table. So this one time at Marine Camp, uh, our guest of honor was an Army Sergeant Major, crusty old Vietnam vet. Um, but instance, Christ was a corporal, as we say. And uh, we picked him up in his dress clothes and we threw him down the table just like we would any other Marine that was brown. And all his medals and all his buttons and all his little shiny accoutrement off his dress uniform was laying at the at his launch point because he hit the table. Um, and apparently he didn't throw him hard enough. He didn't get enough altitude. And so he got to the end of the table. He actually caught the bar, so that was good. He caught the bar, he got him on, said, hey, thanks, Sergeant Major, for coming. You know, here's all your stuff back. He handed him a handful of uniform items. And, um, we weren't allowed to have the party on the base anymore because it was his base. So next year, those are that's well learned get by the way. <laughs> and the, uh, the Sergeant Major told us we were not to, to have that party on his base anymore, and we never did. We went, we had hotels downtown after that, so. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little glimpse in the Marine Corps life. Most to serve or to get the Air Force or the, the Marine Corps. Thank you for the help, Lucy. I may have mentioned that I grew up in San Diego, California. It's kind of a Navy town. My father was Navy served in World War II uh, in almost every major action in the Pacific. Never spoke about it after that. But I could tell that he was quietly proud of his service. I know I was proud of his service. He passed away here recently at the age of 102, still a lot brighter and a lot smarter than his oldest son. Growing up in that town, around that atmosphere, made service seem like the thing to do. And that's what motivated me. The other was, you can't fly a jet fighter unless you wear the uniform. <laughs> so, I'm an Air Force rat. Uh, my father was uh, enlisted for 20 years, and that meant that when I was growing up, I lived on Air Force bases uh, my entire life. And Bill and I have talked this before. We started earlier. It turns out we were both in the Panama Canal zone at the same time, except he was an old cross pilot, and I was a 10 year old going to elementary school. <laughs> so, but uh, <laughs> but uh, while I was there, I remember, uh, and this is in the mid 1970s. I remember going, I would ride my bike out as close as I could get to the flight line, and I remember seeing aircraft like the one 
that's behind us here, the F-16 with the tail painted orange, and the F-15 with the tail painted orange, and this A-10 here painted in different colors. And because all these jets were brand new and under development, and they were down the canal zone doing their tropical testing. And I'd go down there and I'd see them, I'd see them fly. And I said, that's what I wanted to do one day. And I, I grew up Air Force, I wanted to be a pilot. Well, fast forward many years, and the eyesight just didn't uh, work out, so I couldn't be a pilot. But the Air Force blood was still in me. And, and my thought was, it doesn't matter if I can't be a pilot, I still want to be in the Air Force. So the career field for me, when I was going through ROTC, didn't matter. I have, a, I have an 06 colonel in my ROTC detachment that when he found out that I couldn't be a pilot because of my vision, uh, he said, well, I'll give you a scholarship if you're willing to be a uh, ICBM launch officer. And my response was, that's just as good as any other career field as long as I can be an officer. So that's, that's why I was. Uh, for me, it was uh, come from a huge military family. My dad was in the Army for a couple of years back in the uh, early 60s. Um, served on the DMD in Korea. Uh, but he was out of the Army long before I was born, so um, not a huge, you know, military influence or whatever. Uh, however, uh, both my parents worked, they were Department of the Army civilians, and uh, on their base in New Jersey, and mom would take me to work in the summer, so me and my brother didn't kill each other. And um, being around the soldiers and whatnot and seeing, you know, what they're doing, and I was like, oh, it's just like a regular job, cool. So I never really shied away from uh, joining the military, and then finally as you start getting through high school, um, you know, you start, you know, feel a little, uh, you know, big, right? I'm going to be a man soon, so where else do you be a man but in the Marine Corps? So, <laughs> ran away and joined the service. Um, uh, yeah, I joined the Marines mostly for, you know, I still wanted to go to college, wanted to be an aviator, and I thought the Marines was going to be a, a good, good chance to do all that stuff. Um, never really looking at a 20-year career, much less a 33-and-a-half-year career, which I pulled. Um, so it kind of became, all right, let's go do this. It's got a you know, good reputation, solid service, let's go do it. Went ahead and did it, and after I did it for about three or four years, um, keep in mind I was a college student and a reservist and everything, went to Desert Storm within my first year of service. So being a brand new kid, um, seeing that stuff uh, really kind of opened your eyes, and that's when I—that's when you realize what you're doing is—it's uh, important, right? Um, somebody's got to do it, right? When the nation needs you, somebody's got to do it. Might as well we make it. Um, so after that, I, after Desert Storm, or even during Desert Storm, I really kind of threw myself into a military career. Stayed in reserves, volunteered for smack duty and stuff here and there. Um, and then when I hit, hitched up with the Air National Guard, um, that got into my blood real bad. Uh, doing that job, doing the special stuff we did, uh, very few of us were doing what I was doing. Um, that really gets in your blood. Then we start looking at the information you're providing to our national leaders, um, our tactical operators, you know, our fighter pilots, and uh, everything else. You know, you realize what you're doing matters, and that really gets in your blood. So you do that. Um, that's why I stayed for so long. Um, and then once I became an officer, so I, did, I did 19 and a half years as an enlisted guy before I took a commission. But hey, I got a chance to earn one. <laughs> and uh, yeah, keeping up with all the young kids coming out of college was an interesting officer candidate school experience. Because I was 38, and uh, you know, running around officer candidate school with a bunch of 22 year olds. They were like, come on, Grandpa, let's move it. And I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm in, you know. You guys go ahead, save yourselves, you know. Um, and once I became an officer, taking care of the guys underneath me, seeing the work that they do and what they were accomplishing, and making sure I could clear away the obstacles for them, that became a huge part of the job. And that's what really kept me kept me in for so long. That that was why I did that. Okay. I'd like to ask uh, uh, 
journalists rise to leaders in the field. That I want to talk to you up in the air, uh, probably over in Newfoundland, or Greenland, in that area at one time. But I put on a uniform to be a soldier. Korea also. This gentleman here will probably run into you in Germany or somewhere, maybe in our planet. But anyway, uh, are you related to our eyes? But anyway, I don't believe so. Our eyes was a pilot here and also the guy that owns uh, RC Willie. Uh, we call uh, this place parked out of Rocky at four uh, right now. But my grandparents, I lived here all my life. And I, and I remember the, the uh, family being all military. My family was started out in that form of battalion and uh, grew up in Davis County. And then I learned if I knew. And you guys were here, <laughs> uh, uh, different area. But that's what I, my question was. Really is up in the air 13 hours. I was up in the air probably eight hours every day for four days, and then back down. But I would run the I run the new line. Yeah. Thank you to everyone who served in the audience and who is possibly thinking about serving. One more question. Were any of you ever involved in any emergency reaction and procedures as, uh, sparked by an international political crisis? And what did you do? <laughs> Yeah, Intel, right? Okay. Um, this one time, uh, we were flying in South America, and something bad happened in South America, and they changed what we were doing. It was a hostage take. So they took uh, three Americans hostage. We had an airplane down, uh, an American aircraft had crashed, and uh, three crew members survived the crash and were on the ground running for their lives and they took us off of our assigned mission and went after them. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, in that specific instance, we didn't get them back. Uh, I shouldn't say it like that. We got them back eventually. Right? Um, but they were taken prisoner and they were moved all over. Um, we couldn't find them. We went, every time we went down there, we went down there a couple times a year. Uh, and other agencies were looking for them too. And then finally, um, we were down there just doing our regular job, uh, normal targets as it were. And uh, we had a very special briefing that morning, said we were going to hit these guys. And we got them, so we brought them home. So, I think the closest to an emergency, like what you're talking about, or a diplomatic situation, is while I was in Norway. In 2011, um, I had only been at the embassy for about a month, and uh, I was in my office in the embassy, and there was this huge explosion. And uh, what it turned out to be was, uh, and some of you may have remembered this uh, from the news, there's actually a Netflix movie about it, but uh, uh, a lone wolf uh, blew up a car bomb in front of the Norwegian government building, basically their version of the White House, uh, and took down the entire uh, building. Uh, we were about two or three blocks away at the embassy when it went on. Uh, in that instance, uh, so my training as an attaché kicked in, and where at that point they locked down the embassy, 
but I was headed to the front door of the embassy. In fact, the Marine Guard stopped me and said, you can't go out and lock down. And I had to convince this young Marine Guard that I got my job to do. And he let me out the door, and I went in search of where, where the explosion come from. And it didn't take long for me to figure out that it was the, the government building. So made it down there. Uh, was taking pictures with my phone. I wasn't very far from the, uh, uh, the site. But then I had to turn around and go back to the embassy. And now I had to call back to the United States, to the Pentagon, to the National Military Command Center, and let them know what, what was going on, what had happened. And uh, the, uh, we were giving the National Military Command Center reports on this before CNN uh, had it on the news. And then the second part of this, and some of you may remember this, is the same individual that blew up the building, got in his car, drove about 60 miles outside of Oslo uh, to this island on a fjord and uh, started killing teenagers, ended up killing over 60 teenagers on that island. And when we were monitoring the, the news in Norway on that, um, it was myself and a Navy captain were in the embassy, we started putting two and two together. And we said, I think the two are related. And we reported it back. And they, the initial response from the National Military Command Center is, no, it can't be related, stick with the bottom. And we had to insist that no, we think the two are related. And sure enough, it ended up they, they were related. But uh, it was uh, uh, after that, I was part of liaison team with the Norwegian uh, government that actually got to go on site with those, uh, for those events. So it was terrible to see. And uh, although I felt like I'm being part of history there, it was, uh, it was just incredible. I'll try to lighten the mood. As you, some of you have had the experience living overseas is a little different than living here at home. And my favorite experience was, you know, call it that, uh, living in Germany at the time we did the fighter batter mine off gang and uh, others were active. They were kidnapping uh, senior officers. Uh, we had some bomb explosions, etc. People killed. A member of our Aviation Hall of Fame was killed in Germany, uh, basically uh, going about his business and just uh, arbitrarily killed. So there were some, some bad folks there. And so our kids grew up listening to public service announcements on the uh, Armed Forces uh, radio and television network there in Europe. Uh, warning them uh, things to do and not to do and be alert and, and uh, generated a certain amount of uh, paranoia <laughs> uh, in their young minds. Uh, in 1988, I retired, we returned to the United States. I went looking for a job. And uh, my wife and my uh, oldest child, my older daughter, were shopping one day. Uh, in San Diego at a, at a mall. And uh, Christy grabbed her mom and said, Mom, you better call the security police. There's an unintended, unintended package over here. <laughs> she had grown up at that alert. She works at the University of Chicago now. Uh, she also, as I was uh, hired at Delta Airlines, uh, at the end of our training, uh, spouses were flown, uh, given uh, uh, space to uh, fly down and attend a, a dinner. And so my wife uh, arranged for somebody to take care of the kids, and she was going to fly down to Atlanta and join me there. She made the mistake of mentioning that she was preparing, preparing oh, my passport is expired. And my oldest child again said, well, Mom, you can't go to Atlanta without a passport. Where's your passport? She <laughs> was very worried. So, international 
experiences uh, affect all of us differently and affected my children quite a bit. They would not trade those experiences for anything. Uh, they were, in the, in the main, very wonderful experiences. Yeah, I know. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it.